Thank you, Nishama. The story was amazing. Um, great. And one more thing. Uh, fuck Nazis. Can I get a can I get a fuck Nazis? One, two, three, fuck Nazis. Thank you. Jeez. Whew. All right. Um, this is not a political talk, but you know, somebody gives you a mic, you gotta, you know. All right. <clears throat> So uh, I'm here from Primer Stories. Uh, there's a little bit of info here, some links if you want to see uh, some of the stuff online. You may have gotten a chance to check out Primer Stories. I'm not going to um, really show you two, uh, we call them primers, like the pieces themselves, um, because they're, it's a website. So it wouldn't really make sense for me to do that for you um, on your own time. I would just go check it out, but I'm going to explain a little bit about how we got to where we, where we did with this project and um, kind of some of our philosophy behind it. So um, we use a lot of animated GIFs, so there'll be some animations up in this. Um, so, and I won't read you, there's not a lot to read you, but I will read this one slide. So Primer Stories is a visual storytelling website. Uh, we splice DNA from comics, podcasts, magazine articles, and documentaries. Um, our goal is to expand the interactive medium in the same way that podcasts did for radio, which we'll hear a lot about um, from Megan a little bit, and uh, the way that TED Talks did for speaking engagements. We use animation, illustration, and photography uh, to illuminate such topics as the urban air rights trade, hidden gold, grave robbing, and the birth and death of the solar system. Uh, spoilers about that. Uh, <laughs> So, and that's, so that's four stories. We have 50 on the website. We've been doing this for a few years, about three years now. Um, we are, we operate in, in kind of a, a, a seasonal format. So the seasons, uh, last season's format was change. It came out last November, um, last fall. So there's obviously a lot to discuss. Um, half coincidentally, this season's theme is failure. Um, Though it's not actually super political. The, the stuff last season was a little bit more political. Uh, we cover a lot of culture, science, and, um, and some politics stuff. And the, this presentation is not a keynote. I, I used a tool called Webflow, which is actually what we use to create these primer stories. Because um, I'm not much of a coder. My partner, Joe, who's listed here, is also not much of a coder. Um, we're more on the art director side. Uh, and we were able to find uh, some technology that kind of just let us get loose. So, um, yeah, I studied industrial design and kind of found my own way after that. A uh, brief stint at a monster wrestling organization, uh, aquarium set design shop, and uh, some other stuff, and found myself out in the Bay uh, doing graphic design and illustration. Uh, Joe studied film, specifically animation, and he... Um, we, we both do a lot of the same stuff, but we also uh, have some divergent skills, so it helps in that overlap. He's in Seattle, uh, so we do everything uh, remotely. So, uh, this, that background image is an example of something that we did. Uh, so that's oxygen and hydrogen, and it's an animation of um, them existing on their own and then becoming water. Um, so, Little background on the background. Uh, so we, um, because of this skill set, we are able to really do everything from um, helping actually craft the story. If we have a client or if we have a writer, we work with writers. All these those fifty stories are mostly guest writers. So we work with them and uh, help them craft the story, do storyboarding, illustration, animation, and then we put it on the web. So it's kind of a one stop shop. So I'm going to give you a brief tour. Um, of some of our previous work uh, in the kind of story realm. Some are evocative of stories, some are actual stories, and some is more about just conveying information. So this is a piece that Joe did for a contemporary theater up in Seattle. Uh, it was called Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. Uh, I love it, it's great. They sold t-shirts, I didn't get one, I'm bitter. Uh, I'm not bitter, I'm not bitter. Uh, this is a piece, a self-directed piece that I did called Name That Space Rock um, because I could not remember what the deal was with all the different space rocks. <laughs> um, it's the most viral thing I've ever done uh, to the point where somebody on Reddit was not down with the contrast that I used and downloaded it and Photoshopped it and re-uploaded it. <laughs> 
I think that's the new highest form of flattery. Um, <laughs> so this next piece is a comic that Joe did uh, around the time of Occupy Wall Street, kind of showing this, um, you know, just the environment there. Sequential art is, is big in storytelling, obviously. And this last thing is something I did for Make Magazine. Uh, I had a, a column slash comic strip where I showed people how to use their stuff better, basically. Uh, interviewing experts in different trades and trying to share the information that they have um, with people that might just be starting stuff out but who don't want to apprenticeship at a sword maker, swordsmith, or something, for example. Um, so this is us back in art school in uh, 1800. Um, <laughs> good times. Uh, so I just show this to say that we've been working on stuff together for a long time. Um, one kind of unique event was touched upon the idea of collaboration. Uh, we put a panel together for South by Southwest. It's called Indirect Collaboration Collective Creativity on the Web, um, but without the typo in the way that I said it wrong. Um, so that, that just got us thinking about how, how to work together on something that we thought would be really interesting. Um, collaborations are definitely uh, a, a great way to keep yourself and keep your partner in check. Um, I swear by them in like everything I do. I love working with other people. Um, you, you know, you don't want to disappoint people, so it's, it helps you get stuff done. It results in better work. Two minds are often better than one. You can bounce ideas off each other. You can just get more work done. Um, and they help you grow. They help you kick your ego to the curb a little bit, and they help you listen. And um, yeah, just if you haven't collaborated with somebody on a creative project, just do it. Um, so uh, new stories in the web, there's, there's been some changes as of you know, the past few years. Uh, one of them, you might know these guys. Um, that's Adnand and uh, Heyman Lee of Stars of Serial. Um, that was a big deal. Um, again, Megan will go a bit more into podcasting, so I won't get too into it. But that blew up storytelling on a scale via the web that really hadn't been done before. You know, we've had. Uh, you know, procedural crime dramas and things that kind of danced around the edges of what that was, but the time was right. Podcasts weren't new, but something about this just blew up. So stories, and it's still happening. Stories are coming from everywhere. And then now also websites are coming from everywhere. If you listen to podcasts, you'll know about Squarespace. Uh, not quite MailChimp, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but, you know, it's kind of, it's, uncanny, I guess, that those two things kind of came to prominence at the same time. So now everybody can make a website, and it's great to be able to get your stuff on the web if you're not a designer or a developer or any of that stuff. But the drawback uh, is that a lot of that stuff ends up looking the same. And we, as creative individuals, we're kind of not feeling that. Uh, Jim Bull, who talked here uh, from Moving Brands a little while ago, has had a great talk about that. I would recommend, uh, you know, digging that up if you can. So. We were kind of wondering, like, where, where did the weird shit go? Um, what happened to the web as kind of a creative medium? Uh, and so we, we kind of resolved to do something about it. So we took, we knew we had some ingredients that we wanted to include. We had stories, we had collaboration, we wanted it to be on the web, and we wanted it to have a kind of unique voice. So uh, we created Primer Stories, which is, a little bit about what I described earlier. This is an example of six cover images from uh, some of the different stories we've had. Um, some written by guests, other written by uh, others. I recommend, at least if even if this is not your thing, like this disaster at Bay one, they wanted to seal off San Francisco Bay. Yes. <laughs> if you ever go to Sausalito, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers considered this plan for about 30 years. They were like, ah, should we? Nah, it seems really dumb, but maybe we should do it. And so the Army Corps of Engineers was like, let's test it out. So they built the Bay Model. You may have heard of the Bay Model. It's this like vision of the future from you know maybe 1965 or something uh, that you can go check out and kind of tower over it. I recommend if you have like, Godzilla costume or something, like throw that on. Um, but it's, it's just fascinating. So yeah, that started in like 34, whenever the bridges were completed and like presidents supported, it was crazy. Anyway, tangent town. Um, <laughs> so what we do is 
we use this tool that I mentioned. Uh, I'm not on their payroll, so you know, ask me privately again, and I'll tell you about it. But um, it's it's all about constraints for us. You know, the, the collaboration is about constraints. Anything you do, if you're not cons don't have any constraints on yourself, then you know, it's it's really hard to to kind of like dial in what you want to do. But um, that's just a little bit of advice for me. Um, Connecting to stories via uh, storytelling, and in particular visual storytelling. So this is a quick mock-up I made of the internet. Um, <laughs> it's hard to stand out there, you know? It's really hard. Um, so what I, you know, it, you want to have a story, that'll, there, there's a hook, and you want to have imagery. And you don't want to have imagery that you can download from a site that everybody else can get to, you know, you want to get something unique. So it takes a lot of work, but it's worth it. Um, so relating to that story part, um, there's, there's physiological reasons why stories are important. Um, so for instance, um, you've heard of a three-act structure. There's an alternate called a five-act structure, or called something else, um, but it's basically just like these things that happen in between the steps. So this is more or less the same thing. But so acts one, you know, you get started, then you reach some kind of conflict. Here it's referenced as a complication. Um, so when that happens, physiologically, you actually develop um, cortisol in, you know, in your brain. And that enables you to focus. That's why you start to pay attention when shit goes wrong in a film. Um, also, along with that, there's lots of chemicals happening when you're interacting with stories. Um, happy endings aren't just like lovey-dovey. There's dopamine that's released when you encounter a happy ending. Think about food, sex, drugs. All of these things generate dopamine. So add a happy ending, poor phrasing, uh, a great resolution <laughs> to that, and uh, yes. So, and then there's another one. Um, so when, when you encounter, you know, something cute or something like a human that you can relate to or even any character that you can relate to, you generate oxytocin. And that amplifies your ability to, to empathize with people, to literally feel their feelings. So there's a lot of stuff that goes on here, um, kind of behind the scenes. It's not just a catchphrase, because storytelling is definitely a big catchphrase in design, but um, there's some good reason behind it. So um, I kind of mentioned this, just, you know, just this chemistry idea. Um, also, there were some Harvard uh, neuroeconomists that studied all of these things. And they found that when people have all this oxytocin going, they are more willing to give money. So it's great for a charity. Um, I would, you know, Maybe dial it back on, on the corporate side because it's pretty manipulative, but you know, I'm not your dad, so <laughs> what can I do? Um, and then audiences are just going to retain information a lot better when there's imagery involved. Uh, one stat I read said 60,000 times better. I don't know how you quantify that, but let's say many times better. Like, even if it's twice as better, like twice as good, why not go for that? So. Uh, briefly, I'll discuss the role of images and kind of um, the, the roles they play in our stories. So in this first one, um, this represents um, the dragon stone of Lucerne. So in Switzerland, there was a dragon hunter who, um, you know, doing like you do, he was out hunting dragons <laughs> and he saw one and then he passed out. And then he woke up and he found this rock and he was like, oh, that's definitely the dragon has just taken another form. Um, okay, sure. And then he, he took up the cause and just kept hunting, looking for dragons for the rest of his life. So um, the point here is that this is a pretty straight illustration of something in the story. There's no real hidden meaning or anything like that. It's just um, literal is what I called it. So this next one, uh, Sub Rosa, is more, there's a little bit more going on here. So the, the text that accompanied this in the story was uh, referred to Yuri, Yur, um, what is it, Gargarian? Gargarian. Gargarian, thank you. Um, the first man in space. So that's JFK over on the right there. And the subtext here is that 
the year after Yuri went to space was the Bay of Pigs invasion and then the Cuban Missile Crisis. So you might not know that, or you might know that, and depending on you know how much knowledge you bring to the story, you're going to um, enjoy it on on different levels. But at the very least, you'll understand that there's a little bit of tension between the USSR and the USA. So uh, yeah, this is kind of more uh, we call it complementary. So this accompanied a story about Mondegreens, which has anybody ever heard of Mondegreen? Uh, okay, cool. I hadn't until. Uh, Laura Good wrote this story for us, and I mean, I, I knew the phenomenon, and the phenomenon is when you hear song lyrics incorrectly. So, for instance, um, "Tiny Dancer" by Elton John. I'm not going to sing it. Hold, <laughs> sorry. Uh, hold me closer, tiny dancer. That's that's the lyric. A lot of people heard "Hold me closer, Tony Danza." <laughs> right. It's just good. So, um, so this is kind of an illustration of. Uh, th there's not a lot of hidden meaning, but it, it alludes to the the preconceptions that we have and the things that we bring to a conversation. And so, for instance, that the doorway is actually replacing the ear in this. So it's not like super deep, but it's a little bit of a, a kind of a logical step. Um, this is a contextual illustration, so uh, this is just kind of an archaeological dig site. And I would liken this to um, something like an, if you're listening to an episode of Radiolab and you hear a sound effect, uh, it's not something that necessarily uh, is a plot point, but it helps create an environment in which the story can kind of um, just expand. There, I don't know if you see that little animation, there's a little flag there. That's, that's the site with the T-Rex third face. Uh, all right, and so then there's this kind of like data viz thing. This is a fairly light one. So this is uh, the one where the, the universe ends. So in, I believe it's four quadrillion years, Siri, set a reminder for four quadrillion years. Um, this is what's gonna happen. There are gonna be, it's predicted, that there will be stars with just massive, massive stars whose gravity f is far greater than that of our sun. And so as they pass, they're just gonna, these little floozy planets are just gonna take off with those stars. So that's an illustration of, of that phenomenon. And uh, then we have something humorous. Uh, that's always good to have a little levity. So this uh, we sent out in our, um, our Thanksgiving email last year. And you know, there, there's just a cultural shorthand that you can that you can use that just brings everybody's seen this, and everybody's like, "Oh man, that fucking shit!" Yeah, uh, <laughs> but I kind of like it now. Um, in fact, I have a friend who, who's an amazing cook and, and made his own cranberry sauce and then cast it in this shape of this. <laughs> it's like that much of a cultural touchstone. Um, so wrapping up here, um, but I want to point to the future. So this is uh, a reference to virtual reality. And it, it might have been at a talk here, or was that a, a VR thing that I went to? And the way that they referenced it, uh, does anybody recognize the film in the background here? I see one half hand. Yeah, yeah, OK. Um, yeah, so it's, it's the Lumiere brothers. They, they basically invented the motion picture. Um, uh, Edison had like one you could view like this, but they invented one that many people could see at the same time. And so what people are saying about VR right now is that it is at the same point like that this was for film. It's like the first film. People in the theaters jumped out of their seats because they thought they were going to get hit by a train, um, train arriving at the station. So um, in closing, I'll just scroll by some of these sites that we do all these sites for um, you know our stories. Um, but then we got reached out to by the Dodge Foundation uh, to cover a story. And we hired a reporter and a cinematographer to go out in New York Harbor, cover all the plastic that's in the bay there. Um, and as a result of that, we got reached out to by the International Committee of the Red Cross to um, put together a story about refugees in Iraq, Syria, and Yemen. So we're thrilled to be getting this kind of work. And um, we hope to be doing some more of that to, like do gooder type stuff. Um, here's some uh, contact info. I should mention that for this fall season, we are seeking interns. So uh, 
holler at the email that's not there, but I'm at uh, tim at primerstories.com or come find me. Um, there's some stickers back on the table there and um, that'll do it.